Hello everybody. Every week I get an email from someone asking me what car they should buy with an eye to making some money on it. Ignoring the fact that I'm more septic peg rather than mystic meg and the car market is rather volatile at the minute, I think this is always a terrible idea. So today, instead of giving you five cars I think are guaranteed investments, I'm going to give you five cars that I think in the next couple of years stand to cost their owners an awful lot of money. <laughs> If you are on the hunt for a used car, you should definitely know about today's headline sponsor, Car Vertical, the super-powered super search that cross-references a number of databases internationally to give you all the information on a car that you want to know and a seller might not want to disclose, including whether a car has been clocked, if it's been damaged in an accident, regardless of whether it's been written off, or for other things like usage as a taxi. For a special discount on the service, please check the link in the description down below. So, on to the list then. Five cars that I think are guaranteed to lose a lot of money. And we start with a car that not so long ago people were paying significant overs for, the Porsche Cayman GT4. Now, in truth, it's more the 718 that I'm talking about. The earlier GT4, the 981 generation, has somewhat stabilised in price. But looking at that tells you what's going to happen with the 718. Fact is, when that car was a year or so old, people were still paying big money for them, in many cases more than the original RRP. However, as time progressed, people got used to it and realised that yes, it was a very, very good car, but it wasn't the second coming, things did become a little bit more sensible. What is interesting and important to note is that in the last year or so where prices of things like GT3s have shot back up again, stuff like the GT4 hasn't really followed suit. And I think that shows you the market isn't quite so enthusiastic about the Cayman as it is the 911. In the case of the 718, people were initially asking overs for the car as they do with just about any Porsche these days, but there was something that they didn't really want to tell you. There were a lot coming, and many of them hadn't arrived. Now, recent events means that the supply has slowed down again, so you've still got this illusion of these cars being very difficult and hard to find. However, trust me, that's not the case at all. Unless Porsche suddenly decide they don't want to make the rest of the GT4 allocation, there's going to be plenty to go around. And over the last year, I heard many stories of customers being phoned in secret by their dealers saying, um, do you want to buy one of these cars? Which tells you only one thing, they couldn't actually find buyers for all of them. And of course the reason this was done in secret was because if it got out that just about anybody actually could have one of these, that ruins your second hand flipping market. The 718 is certainly a great car and one I don't think that stands to lose masses in the future, however please be wary, do not pay a penny over list for a car, particularly if it's already got some miles on, and don't be fooled by anybody who says that they are a genuine limited edition thing that you're going to have to murder your granny to get a hold of, because that simply isn't true. Don't believe me? Look at prices of the originals. A few years ago, you're paying over a hundred grand for one. Now, you can get them for closer to 65 or 70. And the 718, to me, doesn't look quite as good, doesn't sound quite as good, and because there are now two generations of the car, that makes both of them just a little bit less special. If anything, the one that I think stands a better chance of holding its money is the second generation Boxster Spider, because that actually is quite different to the first. So. Cayman GT4, that's number one on the list. Now, an honourable mention, the Lotus Emira. James, what are you talking about? Everybody wants the Emira, everyone I know has put an order down on one. Yes, they have. Very, very popular car, and I'm sure it's probably going to be pretty darn good, because it's a Lotus, and like McLaren, though the company and I don't always see eye to eye, the products are almost always brilliant. However, I think Lotus have made a couple of mistakes with the Amira. There is very little you can choose in terms of exterior or interior colours, only the preset ones that Lotus offer you, and essentially all of the first cars being delivered are going to be the first editions, so the spec sheet is going to look pretty much identical. When you've decided you've had your fun with your Amira and you come to sell it, what you're going to find is that there are already loads of them out there that look very much like the one that you've bought. 
and that's never helpful when it comes to trying to shift a car like that. I am also somewhat fearful that Lotus dealers haven't quite learned their lessons of the past few decades, and they may not give people the customer experience that they're expecting, especially if they have just come from something like a Cayman GT4. I'm pretty sure that supply is going to be limited enough in the early days to keep interest high, but I have a suspicion in about two years or so, the V6 will be ditched, a new higher powered version of the four cylinder will come along, and then unless you're a diehard for the old naturally aspirated Toyota lump, which I really do like and would have, if you have bought into the AMG that I know a lot of people want, I think you may be in trouble because you're suddenly going to find yourself with a car that's actually much, much worse spec than the one they will then be selling. And trust me, Lotus have absolutely no qualms whatsoever about leaving customers in the lurch. Once they've got a new thing to sell to people, they'll do it. They won't wait. They won't take four or five years between models. They'll just shove it out there as soon as they can. I can kind of see it from a business perspective, but in terms of customer attention, it's never a good idea. So um, if you're getting an Amira, please do enjoy it, love it, but um, don't think it's going to be worth that much forever. The good news is that overall, Lotus residuals do tend to be very, very strong, and even the Evora in the face of the Amira is still holding its value. My Evora 400, I bought brand new, and over two years and 25,000 miles, I lost only 13,000 pounds, which for a brand new sports car, is really quite exceptional. You'd lose far more than that in the first few months on many a BMW. So that's the reason the Amira didn't actually make the list, but I think you should still be wary if you're thinking of buying one, particularly the early AMGs. The Toyota, I think, is going to be the safer bet because although it will be phased out probably sooner, it's also the one that's going to have the enthusiast appeal. Next up, another brilliant sports car that I wouldn't blame anybody for buying and I've thought of on more than one occasion, but avoided because I think prices currently are just a little bit too high. And that's the first, or well, 2005 generation, Aston Martin V8 Vantage. A wonderful, beautiful, great sounding, excellent handling and very, very special British sports car. What could go wrong? Well, as it happened, lots can go wrong, and when it does, it can be very expensive, and even if it hasn't broken, servicing these things is just that little bit more pricey than your equivalent 911, Cayman, Boxster, or M3. And I think over the last couple of years, a lot of people have come to the V8 Vantage because they found themselves in a situation where they've got a bit of spare money, they're not driving as much as they used to, so why not? Chop the Golf in for an Aston Martin, feel like a king. And that's a very, very good choice, but... There are probably lots of people out there who've had the car for a year now, enjoyed it, got the bug out of their system, are ready to move it on, or a few that have suddenly realized, actually, we do need to start driving every day now, or maybe something's gone wrong, the service has come along and it was a lot more than they were expecting, and they've decided time to get rid. You also cannot escape the fact they are quite thirsty cars, and with fuel prices, even though they're not as high as they have been, they're still darn high. I think a lot of people are going to be thinking, hmm, maybe time to move the Aston on. And the telltale here is that though prices being asked on things like Auto Trader and eBay are still pretty high, when the cars go to auction, they achieve figures much closer to what I would expect. It's also important to note that these were cars whose prices went up about 18 months ago, rather than about sort of six to 12 months ago when a lot did. This is because they were cheap enough. I mean, you could get one in theory for sort of 18 to 20 grand. Dealers were desperate to sell them. People were using their bounce back loans to get into them. Stuff like the R8 also went up at the same time. And though I really, really do love the V8 Vantage, and in some ways it probably was an undervalued car, it's also one that's got high enough running costs I think people will eventually be scared. They'll go back to their 911s, return to what they know, and so we may see a softening of prices. For me, if you can pick up an example of an early V8 Vantage in good condition with a reasonable history and a decent specification for around the £25,000 mark, that seems about right. Any more than that, it would have to be something really rather good. And to be honest, a lot of those cars are just not out there. They've been cheap for long enough that at some point in time, they probably haven't been cared for in the way that they should. So these are cars, if you're buying into them, do expect the purchase price to be only really your initial payment. Still, a lovely car though, and I definitely would. Next up, number three. This is a car that could be a little bit controversial. The BMW M5 CS. Now, just about everyone who's got their hands on it and driven it says it's brilliant. I have yet to sample it, but I did drive the M2 CS, and that was a fantastic car. That, though, was already 90,000 quid. The M5 
is 150 grand. And I have seen some examples going for as much as 180, though at the moment there are none for sale at quite that price. That is an extreme amount of money for an M5. And here for me is the issue and the reason the M5CS has made this list. Yes, it's brilliant. Yes, it's wonderful. Yes, it's probably better than the other M5s and it's a limited edition. I believe only some 26 cars are coming to UK shores. But at 90 odd grand, I think there are people that can afford the M2CS because though that is a heck of a lot of money for an M2, it's also just about the same money you pay for a normal M3. And there are clearly lots of people that can buy a normal M3. However, the M5CS, that's another step on. 150 grand plus, you're getting into some fairly serious metal. And because it's a limited edition, I think there are a lot of people that are going to be buying it for investment, which is great if you're not going to drive it. I think a lot of people are going to be buying that car, hoping it'll do the same thing as the M3 CSL or the M3 GTS, and over the years it will be worth serious cash. This may be true. However, the problem is, when there are only 26 in the country, if you are that one person who buys it and wants to drive it, then when you come to sell yours, if it's the only one with any miles on, you are going to have to ask a lot less money than the others to get it sold. And if further evidence were required, Chris Harris has actually bought one. And he would be the first person to tell you that he doesn't have a lot of luck in terms of buying and selling cars at the right time. He struggled to sell his GT3 RS 4 litre. He also then chopped it in, I think, for A599, bought an FF when they were strong, so on and so forth. I mean, if you can do i mean you please do you know if you want to buy expensive cars fine just know that they're going to be expensive cars however don't buy into them thinking that they're going to make you money or be essentially free because i just don't think that's a guarantee at all the other thing with the m5 cs is that when you see them half the time they're being hoofed around a track and i'm sure people will tell you that on a track it's much better than the regular m5 and i'm sure it is much better than a regular m5 but let's not kid anybody it's a terrible car to take on track, isn't it? It's massive, it's heavy, it's really powerful, it's going to knacker its tyres and brakes reasonably quickly. Nobody's going to take a limited edition M5 CS on track. Why would you do that? If you have that kind of money, you're going to have something else for track. There are better BMWs for track use. The M2 CS is probably an infinitely better track car. But then on road, you may find that it's equally too much and too expensive and too delicate, or well, yeah, not delicate, but uh, you don't want to risk it in terms of taking it to a car park and stuff like that, especially if it's got the nice frozen paints and things on it. So I think people will get it, and even if they intend to use it, go, oh, yeah, yeah actually, I, I, don't, I don't think I'm going to take the car out. So I think it's going to be a car that a lot of people look at and go, ooh, but long term, yeah, either buy it and don't drive it and just look at it, or um, get something else. And to be honest, if you're just going to look at a car, get a picture or a scale model. Next up for honourable mentions is the Ferrari SF90. Yes, there are plenty of Ferraris out there that as soon as you buy them, they do shed a fair amount of cash. Historically, in Britain, it was the four-seaters that always hemorrhaged money. So, the SF90. Only two reasons, really, it wound up on the honourable mentions roll rather than the main list. Uh, first off, they are almost out of production. I believe the order book for the coupe is now closed and the spider not far behind it. Secondly, if you weren't aware of the fact that these were hemorrhaging money, this video was already no good to you anyway. These cars, for various reasons, and I hope to drive one soon and see what it's all about, just aren't doing all that well. Nearly every other Ferrari out there, new one at least, is generally holding its money. Maybe not all of it, but doing a pretty good job. When you look at percentages, it's actually not horrific, and in some cases, they are very, very strong. But the SF90 bucked that trend. I think maybe the market just doesn't understand quite what the car is, quite what it offers, or there were too many people who bought into it exclusively to try and move it on, which, of course, muddies the market when so many people have bought it and are jumping out of it straight away. It does make things a little difficult because then as a buyer, you've got lots and lots of choice, so you can afford to be picky. These are cars that were losing some £100,000 out of the box. And that's a scary amount of money. That's something like 25% of the car's value instantly. And, um, yeah, 
That's going to hurt. They may, however, as a second-hand purchase, make quite a good bargain because if they do drop to sort of two hundred fifty to three hundred thousand pounds, I think they could be worth getting into as an interesting and unusual alternative to something like a Lamborghini Aventador. They're only a little bit less usable. Um, why not? It's a thousand horsepower car. It's a proper serious hybrid hypercar, essentially a baby LaFerrari for. Um, I don't know, sixth of the price, an eighth of the price, something like that. They could make an interesting buy, but uh, as a new purchase, if you've got an order in and you think you're going to be safe with your money, uh, sorry, hate to tell you, no. Next up on the list, and a car that may surprise some, the all-new Maserati MC20, which I think is probably going to be the next NSX. In other words, very, very few people are actually going to be brave enough to buy it. It is going to hemorrhage cash in the first couple of years, and then in about four or five years, or maybe when they can it, it'll start to go back up in value again. So if you're in this for the long haul, you may be safe. But in the short term, if you're the sort of person that sells a car after about 18 to 24 months, eh, buyer beware. Why is this car on the list? Couple of reasons. First off, they're a lot more expensive than you think. The list price, I have a price list here, is £190,000. However, start throwing options at them and they get expensive real quick. They really aren't that much cheaper once you've chucked options at them than anything from Ferrari or Lamborghini. Let me give you an example. The exterior carbon pack, which gets you a dual pipe exhaust system in dark matte finish, carbon fibre front splitter, carbon fibre rear diffuser, carbon fibre underdoor and wing sill inserts, and a carbon fibre bonnet. 34 grand. Yeah. Yeah, 34 grand. And they have an options list they call the Fiori Seria, which I think is their kind of you know, individual special options list, like a Lamborghini's ad personum. You want a matte blue Corsa paint, which I'm sure looks beautiful. 27,000 quid. That's, that's a lot. That's a heck of a lot. Solid hyper green paint, 16,000 pounds. There's not actually masses of options to spec, but they're all really, really pricey. Carbon fibre seat back, £4,300. Not different seats, I think, it just says the seat back. <sighs> yeah, pricey, pricey car. There are quite a few up for sale now at around the sort of quarter million pound mark, and I just don't think that they're actually going to hold their money. Now, while they're limited, while you can't get a hold of them, I think they're going to do reasonably well. However, like the NSX, people are going to realise, where is your nearest Maserati dealer? Because all I see are Maserati dealers that are no longer there. Places that used to have a franchise and have said, if no, we don't want to deal with it. It's an oddball brand. I mean, I, I love the products. I had a Maserati. It was a fantastic thing. I will have another. But the MC20, it's got a turbo V6 engine. All the videos I've seen, it sounds pretty naff. It's a huge car. I do have concerns about how practical and usable it would be, certainly day to day if you want to take it out and about, that sort of stuff. Everyone says it drives really, really nicely, but let's be honest here, it's a supercar. I think the most important thing is that it looks and sounds great. And on those fronts, the MC20 is debatable. In the flesh, and I did see one going past a few weeks ago in lovely yellow, it does look a little bit better than in photos. However, it sounded naff. A twin turbo V6 that's fairly muffled, that's just not the soundtrack you expect from a supercar. And if you're buying a car for investment, the best thing to do is to buy one whose place in history is known. Even though they're way overpriced at the minute, something like a Ferrari 458, I think, is going to be a much safer bet. They're going to be the last naturally aspirated V8 Ferrari out there. That's just done. That's been pretty obvious for quite a while now. They are fairly easy to run, maintain, use. I think there are even still a few out there that might have, well, maybe one service left for free, but they aren't that bad to keep going. And Ferrari dealers are all over the place, and in the rarefied world of the supercar, Ferrari are just about as mainstream as it gets. Maserati, a little bit more difficult. If anything with the MC20 is like stuff with the other Maseratis, it's going to be a slightly awkward car to own. I don't think the customer service or just the, the whole experience is really there. And so I think there'll be a lot of people buying into it that maybe find themselves just a little bit disappointed that they tried to do something different and they'll go, yeah, we're out. I think, again, at the moment, limited supply is going to keep prices artificially buoyant, but as soon as supply improper does resume, I just don't think many people are going to commit to it. And if you are hoping that rarity alone is going to keep prices high, 
Well, nobody really bought an NSX either, and that didn't stop them from losing about a hundred grand in the first couple of years. Whether the MC20s will be quite that dramatic, I couldn't say. But uh, yeah, I'd be very, very cautious about one of these if you can't afford to lose that amount of money. My final entry for the honorable mentions list is the Mercedes-Benz AMG GT Black Series. A pretty wild and crazy thing by all accounts, and again, those who've driven them, that doesn't include me, says they're actually really, really good. But people are also asking over £400,000 for them. I also heard that the early cars, you couldn't really specify in any sort of interesting way. This is one thing I thought Mercedes really screwed up on, because you're already spending over 300000 quid on an AMG GT that in other guises you can buy for a hundred odd grand. Okay, yes, I know it's a very, very different car. But surely at that point, you just let your customer do what they want. There's not going to be many bought ever, so they're going to be rare, which does help. But surely if you want your crazy, you know, AMG, GT, solar beam, yellow paint, just let them. It's 30 grand, whatever. Yeah, customers buying a car at that price, they're just going to pay the price. They don't really care. Uh, poor old Tim Schmi had to go and get his repainted because Mercedes wouldn't give him the colour that he wanted. But now I believe you can actually have them customised and personalised to your requirements. So there are going to be quite a few cars out there that are now more interesting and special in terms of specification. So that's going to knacker the values potentially of the early ones if there's a colour you desperately wanted that wasn't available in the early palette. However... I just think this is a car which people are going to struggle to justify. It's a lot of cash. Again, I think the market at the moment is keeping things artificially high. But look at the SLS. When that was new, people didn't get it. And they were about 150 grand. And they were a really, really cool car. They looked different. Okay, they weren't brilliant to drive, but they were a little bit different. They were a little bit out there. And even today, an SLS is a very, very special thing. And would I spend 450 grand on a GT Black Series or 150 on an SLS? I mean, you'd just get the SLS, wouldn't you? I mean, you could have a fleet of amazing and interesting Mercs for the price of one AMG GT Black. So I think unless you're a serious diehard collector, the Black is probably just a car to avoid. And again, if you don't believe me, look at the prices of every other AMG GT they haven't done so well. And I think overall, there have been far too many iterations of the model. You have the GT, GTC, GTS, GTR, GTR Pro, and now the Black. That's a lot of cars to keep track of. So maybe in future, the Black Series will be well remembered, but there have been many other Blacks in the past, and those certainly do hold the money better than other variants of the same model. But none of them, as far as I'm aware, are sort of serious, crazy, brilliant, worth twice as much as they were when new. Oddball car. Oddball car, I think. But still an honourable mention because it is rare and special enough that maybe the people buying into it are the sort of people that don't care and they consider it something very, very different to the regular car, so they're just going to go with it and they don't care that it's loads and loads of money. And now, the final car on the list. And again, this is a brilliant car, but one that at the minute I think is just a little bit too much money. And that's the McLaren 570, including the 570S, the 570 GT, and I suppose to some extent the 540C as well. Not that really many people actually bought one of those, except seen through glass, who definitely regret that. Now, 570, brilliant car. Excellent steering, some of the best you'll find in any car. An exciting engine once you get a few RPM behind it. Brilliant gearbox, a very special feeling and looking thing. Even if I don't love the styling, it certainly stands out. And yes, it's a McLaren. Yes, it has lots and lots of problems, but there are now independents out there like Thorny who can look after them. They're currently expanding their global network. So if you don't like dealing with McLaren dealers, there are plenty of options to keep the cars going. This is only really a good thing for people going forwards. But a couple of years ago, nice 570S would have set you back 75 grand. And at the time, a 12C would have been sort of similar money, maybe a little bit less for a coupe, a little bit more for a spider. And a good 650 was 90 to sort of 110, depending on spec. Currently, a 12C is maybe a little bit more than they were. And a 650, again, like a little bit more, like five grand more maybe than they were. But the 570, I see them going for 115. And people do pay over £100,000 for them. Great cars, yeah, but guys, 
they are going to drop back down. They just will, for many, many reasons. First off, people will buy them, they've had their fun, they'll get out of them. Dealers will come along, try and sell you something new, they'll offer you whatever it is that you want for your 570, and they'll just punt them off and they'll send them to auction, where they probably won't go for masses of money, the market will start panicking, and then people will just sort of start dropping the prices to try and shift them along. Dealers learned that McLarens can be bad news. There are lots and lots of car dealers that I know that simply don't want to take McLarens as part X because they've been burned in the past. This isn't necessarily McLaren's fault, by the way, but this is just the nature of the beast. Car dealers tend to be more interested in how long a car is going to be in stock than how much money they're actually going to make off it. Strange to some, I know, but true. And car dealers, please back me up. That's generally how they say it works. And, of course, a lot of people will have heard of McLaren's reliability issues and they'll go, yeah, it's okay, don't worry, we'll just get a warranty with it. But a warranty alone, even from Thorny, is about £3,000. And if you've been used to, say, an R8, where the warranty is half as much, that's a lot of money. Servicing is still a lot of money, even when it's done reasonably, it is still expensive because of the nature of the beast. If things do go wrong, they can be expensive, and even if they aren't expensive, sometimes the kicker is how long it takes to get parts. So I think there are a lot of people out there that wanted to get the supercar thing out of their system. McLaren seemed to offer really, really good value for money. They look like a good alternative, say a GT3. They are a lot more special. I think they're a bit better to drive in some ways, not so much in others. The engine in the GT3 is definitely better. But they bought the car, had it, maybe they've had no problems whatsoever, they've had it for a year, time to move it on, you know, had their fun, great, okay, let's get rid. Other people maybe have been a little bit burnt, they've gone, oh, I've not had such a good time with this car, I'm a bit worried, let's get out of it. And ultimately, I just don't see these cars holding their money. The Artura is not doing so well, um, that may actually help the 570 value stay high, because if nobody buys Artura, then, well... They're just going to be stuck with it. On the other hand, if Artura really, really doesn't do well, we may see a repeat of a few years ago where McLaren will be so desperate to shift those, they'll offer you silly money on your 570 and then just again pump those out to auction where they'll be sold for peanuts and the market will get a little bit scared and wobbly and people will kind of run out of those. Also, at the end of the day, 570 prices may go down again. They probably will go down again. But for me... The 650 is just a much better car. Better riding, maybe not quite better steering, but damn close. Better, more exciting engine, despite being very similar. It does just feel just that, that little bit better. In the grand scheme of things, it's also not really that much more expensive or difficult to run. And I think it is a much better car and much better value. So if you are thinking of buying a McLaren, I, believe it or not, I'm not going to put you off. But I would put you off buying a 570. Definitely put you off buying a 540. Don't buy a 540. Go get a 650S. Seriously, just, just do it. The car is incredible. One of the best supercars ever made, hands down. So there we have it. Five cars I'm telling you not to buy that are now almost certain to double in value over the next 12 months. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you are on the hunt for a new used car, don't forget to check out Car Vertical because it is a very, very handy service. Link in the description down below. Tell me if you think I am wrong all right please let me know your reasoning always show your workings in the comments and i hope to see you in the next video until then don't forget to like comment down below subscribe and if you haven't already hit the bell icon so you'll be notified of my next video bye bye